Thank you. So thanks again for inviting me to give the keynote in this conference. Um, and uh, as, um, so I'm the Chief Science Officer of MyHeritage and Associate Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. But before I had these roles and, and while I was an undergraduate student, I worked as a hacker in a computer security company. And we used to be invited by banks and credit card services in order to conduct penetration tests and find vulnerabilities in their systems. And what you're going to see over here is one of my favorite hacks. This is me about 15 years ago. And here is the door to the IT department of a major bank in Israel. Now this door is controlled by a fingerprint reader, but also by an intercom. It's a very simple device. You press on the button, it calls the secretary, and if he or she knows you, they would press eight and the door will open. Currently, it is 10 p.m. There is no secretary in the building. What I'm going to show you is that each one of you can open this door simply using your own cell phone by dialing eight from the outside. The point over here is that we dial to, the, to, the, to this like, uh, secretary and then we, we press eight on the phone and the door opens and we can take the money. Now the, the point of doing such a process is that by conducting this vulnerability research, we can take these results to the security manager of this bank and have a constructive discussion about the gap that they have in their system. And my talk is constructed the same way. I'm going to present to you several gaps in genetic privacy, and you're going to be kind of like the security manager in the Q&A, and we are going to have this constructive discussion how we can move forward with genetic privacy. That's a point. Now, genetic privacy is far more complicated than protecting your own bank account due to several challenges. The first challenge that we have is that we need to share genetic information. This was discussed in this meeting quite extensively, but let's remind to everyone that we, if we don't share genetic information, we cannot pinpoint, we cannot identify the pathogenic variants in really devastating genetic disorders. Here, what we see over here behind me, this is a girl that was presented to the clinic of my mother-in-law. I'm a very familiar person, if you didn't realize. She was presented to my mother-in-law's clinic uh, with this hemifacial microsoma and the absence of the earlobe. And also there are several people in her family with similar phenotype like that. We wanted to study to find the causal uh, mutation in this uh, uh, young uh, girl. And during the course of the study, she also developed medulloblastoma. So it's really like a poor case. We uh, did exome sequencing. We couldn't identify the causative mutation. It was not an exonic one. It was actually a copy number variation. So we also conducted and uh, we ran an array. We found this duplicated uh, gene, which is OTX2 that involves in facial uh, development. And we were able to, and, and this OTX2 duplication also explains, could explain also the medulloblastoma phenotype because it's one of the most uh, common amplified genes in medulloblastoma. So we could help this family, but the reason we could do that is because we could contrast her genome to the genomes of thousands of Ashkenazi Jewish individuals who contributed their data for research. And we could help her. So, but. Sharing genetic information is not only important in, for medical genetics, it's also important for genetic genealogy. So we at MyHeritage, we have close to three million people in our database. We started only about two years ago to sell these direct-to-consumer kits, and our database is largely expanding. And this enabled us to connect people, families all over the world. And if you saw my, my short presentation last night, let me just repeat this story quite quickly. This person is Dotan, and he uh, lives not far away from where I live. He was adopted from Brazil about 30 years ago. When, uh, about, about when he was 25 years old, he went back to Brazil with his, all the adoption records that he could find, went to the hospital in this rural town in Brazil, and wanted to see whether like, these records match anything, because in the records, they don't say the, his mom's name, just say the date of birth, the hospital and that's it. Went to the hospital, talked with several people, and the nurse there said, you know what, we don't see any record that match your own record. There was not a single baby that was born in this hospital during that date. And for him, this was devastating because, you know, 
He keeps saying, I don't know what happened in the first month of my life. Maybe someone kidnapped me from, from my crib, and there is a mother somewhere out there that is waiting for me. So what is going on? And nobody could answer that. Um, he tested with family tree DNA, couldn't find any close matches. I asked him, I told him, why don't you upload your data to my heritage? Because we allow people to contribute, to come with their own data from other services and upload their data for free to our service. He did that, and two weeks later, this was a huge coincidence, his half-sister that lives in New Zealand uploaded her ancestry data to my heritage as well, and they found each other. I look at their X chromosome, they share the same mother. Probably this is like, it doesn't happen twice that you kidnap a baby from the crib, so probably this mother had some, um, due to some life circumstances, had to give uh, her two babies for adoption. But this really changed his perception about his adoption case. And this was not maybe a, some crime that was involved in that. And the reason I'm, I'm so attached to this uh, um, story is because Dotan is my first cousin, and this is my family picture during Rosh Hashanah uh, this year. So we can help people. If you share genetic information, you can connect individuals, and it's not like your bank account that you want to keep it secret. You want to share genetic information, and it helps for medical reasons and also for societal reasons like that. The second challenge in genetic privacy, that it's damn complicated. So here is a, here's a story. Jim Watson, there is a room in this complex after his name, right? He knows DNA, and he was one of the first individuals to be fully sequenced. Now, Jim said, you know what, like, at that time, I think he was like 80 years old. He said, I don't care about my genetic privacy, really. I'm going to give all my data out there. But I had this, like, family member that suffered from Alzheimer. I don't want to know my Alzheimer status. I don't want to release it to the public. So we know that APOE is the largest risk factor for Alzheimer. And the researchers said, you know what, don't worry. We're going to just redact your Alzheimer from the genome. We're going to give this, like, entire like all the data, but all the reads that align to this region, we're going just to remove them so you'll be safe. But then, basically, some smart researchers at Peter Vischer Group in Australia thought, yeah, you can redact the Alzheimer region, but we can impute it back. If we see many other genomes with Alzheimer, we can look at the other variations, by standard variations, and we can get back the Alzheimer. And now I know we have some diverse audience over here. I'm not going to explain how genetic imputation works, but just to give you a flavor about the process if you're not a, a computational geneticist. So here is this sentence, right, in English. How many of you can read this sentence? Raise your hand, let's do it by show of hands. Everyone in this room can read this sentence. Now here is something crazy. You know, there are so many missing letters in this sentence, and each letter we have 20, 26 possibilities. So if you think about the amount, the, the search space that your brain had to kind of like go and, and, and find the right sentence, that would be like insane, right? But you could do that like instantly. Why is that? Because as English speakers, you saw so many words in English already. Your brain kind of like have a list of words in English, derived some rules about that two letters can, that usually they don't come together or they usually do come together, and then very quickly you can find a sentence that makes sense. The same way genetic imputation works, by looking at many, many genomes, like this, like this, like words in the dictionary, many, many genomes, we know that two variations usually co-vary together, and they co-inherit together. So if I see one of them, I can actually tell about the second one. So if I see here this, not the upper E region, but the kind of like nearby region, I can look around and then complete back the region. So the moral of the story that genetic information is quite, genetic privacy, is quite complicated. Even Nobel laureate Jim Watson discovered the structure of DNA not so far away from here, could not get it right. Okay, the third challenge is, and we discussed it also last night briefly, is this concept of where the consent lies, right? Your genomic information affects your family. If it affects your family, is it okay really to share genetic information without the consent of your family? But here is something that really sucks, right? So you share, if you have a monozygotic twin, you have 100% of your genome with your monozygotic twin. Most of us don't have a monozygotic twin, so it's maybe we don't need to ask this twin. With your first-degree relatives, you share 50%. 
then second degree relatives, 25%, it's still quite a lot. You can go to a second cousin. A second cousin, is three po it's about 3% of your genome. Where do you stop? One is like you don't consult family members. And I think there is a very simple solution to this problem. You stop at the individual. As I said last night, the individual is the atomic unit of consent. Why is that? Let's take this case, this uh, Tunisian blogger. She wanted to protest female rights in our country. She took a half-naked photo of herself, uploaded it to Facebook. In her country, this is something that affects her family member. Now, if you support liberal values, you say, of course she had the right to do that. Of course, there is no question. She should not consult with her family. She wanted to protest. This is the same way with DNA. Your DNA is part of your body. If DNA is part of your body, you can do whatever you want with your DNA, despite its effects on your family members, because it's your own right, the same way that you can upload half-naked photos, if you want, to Facebook. OK, so what's the plan for tonight, or this afternoon? I'm going to tell you two stories about genetic privacy. The first one is how we can derive surnames from whole genome sequencing data, allegedly anonymous whole genome sequencing data, and then identify individuals using the surname. This part of the story only affects the males here in the audience. So females, you're fine for the first one. But hold on. For the second story, I'm going to tell you how we can identify people by autosomal matches in genetic genealogy databases from your family members. And this affects both sexes in the audience over here. OK, so let's go and start talking about the first story. So we know for about for two years, 20 years now, 30 years, about the correlation between Y chromosomes and surnames. So basically here we have a family, the Smith family over here, and if this family have a son, then the father will give his son the Y chromosome, and in most Western societies also the surname. Now if this son is getting married, and also have a son, he will give him his Y chromosome and also his surname, and what you see is this correlation, we start to see this co-segregation between the surname and the Y chromosome. And this goes for generations and creates unique Y chromosome haplotypes that are associated with surnames. Some companies in the field of genetic genealogy are very aware of that and offer services where they will send you a swab that you can sample the DNA in your cheek, you put it in an envelope, send it to these companies, and they will genotype a series of short tandem repeats, STRs, on the Y chromosome, and we put that in some internet databases. And these short tandem repeats look like that. They have the same, uh, same motif, and this motif just repeats over and over again. We can measure the length of the number of repeats and document these repeats, and this is the Y chromosome haplotype. What you see over here are my own test results. And the reason that people are doing these tests is because it's a lot of fun. You can learn about your patrilineal line. I learned from my uh, Y chromosome haplotype that I have a, a haplotype that is quite common in Jewish Kohanim, Jewish priests. And I knew by all tradition that my family is a Kohen, like is, is a Jewish priest family. And this was pretty cool to see that in my DNA. You can find uh, relatives and you can connect maybe with the black sheep in your family. So many people actually take this type of tests uh, on the Y chromosome. And this is pretty cool. And, and Things were available. Now this database actually was shut down, this example, uh, due to some GDPR concerns, but they were available online at ysearch.org. And at that time of the study, we actually studied two databases, smgf.org and ysearch.org. Both of them don't exist right now, but there are other databases. I will not mention them today, but very similar concept applies to them as well. At that time of the study, we had about 140,000 records that were publicly available in these two databases of surnames and Y chromosome haplotypes. Okay, so if you look at these databases and you look at kind of like the number of records in each database for each surname and the correlation of the same surname in the US uh, census, there is a significant correlation. So Smith is the top surname in the US census, but also in these two databases, following by Johnson, Williams, Brown, and so on. So they kind of like reflect the composition of the US population. Now, how do we can actually uh, um, find the surname in, like to know whether we can find a surname in this database? So the process is very simple, our algorithm. We're going to take a target, 
and we got the Y chromosome of the target, and then we're going to scan every record in this database. Every time I see a record in the database, I'm going to use these STRs, the differences between the STRs to estimate the time to the most recent common ancestor. I know the mutation rate on the Y chromosome on each STR, and I know the number of differences, and therefore I can estimate the TMRCA. Now, if the TMRCA is really, really ancient, let's say it goes to the times of the Greek or something like that, you know what, these two people probably don't share the same surname because the surname system, even here in, in the UK, was invented a few hundred years ago, about, I think, 600 years ago in the UK. In other parts of Europe, it's even more recent. But in some cases, I'm going to be quite lucky. And then I'm going to see that these two individuals, they share a relative, relatively recent common ancestor, maybe a few generations ago, maybe five, six, maybe 10 generations ago. And if this thing happens, I know that they probably share the same surname because this ancient uh, uh, patrilineal uh, ancestor was after the surname system was invented. So un unless there was some non-paternity event, some hunky-punky in the family, or the surname was changed, was changed due to some reason, they should have the same surname. So to really test this algorithm, we took the YSTRs of a real person we took these two databases and we queried the two databases. We applied our algorithm and then we inferred the surname. We compared whether the surname that we inferred is the same as the surname of the real person. To gain some statistical um, power to, for this calculation, we repeated the process with more than 900 individuals. And we corrected for uh, using stratified sampling for the composition of the US population. What we found was that for US uh, individuals with um, European heritage, we have a 12% chance to successfully recover the surname using this process. Now you say, okay, what's 12% is so low? Yes, but if you think about the all of us cohort with one million individuals, that means that about 10% of the cohort can be exposed using this process, which is not that great. Last night we talked about the five million people in the UK, so if the same statistics apply to the UK, then we get to half a million people that could be exposed in this cohort. Now, most of the time when the algorithm fails, it doesn't fail with like giving me the wrong surname. It just says, I don't know. The common ancestor is too ancient and I don't want to make any prediction. Okay, so we can predict the surnames. And what we found that most of the surnames that we can predict are quite rare. It's quite hard to predict Smith, apparently, because that it's not a single surname. It was invented in multiple locations, uh, uh, this surname was, was, was uh, acquired by families in multiple locations. It's very hard to predict the ultra rare surnames because they're just not in the database. So kind of like what we have usually, we have this like surnames that are quite rare but not ultra rare. In most cases, if I know the surname of a person, I can reduce my search space by about a factor of 5,000 fold. So if I start with the US population, and that is about 325 million people, half of them are males, I apply this process, I get to about 40,000 individuals or so, 40,000 males. But now you might ask, okay, Aniv, so now you give me 40,000 individuals. That's not breaching genetic privacy. There are still so many options. So here is the thing. If I combine the surname that I inferred with some other um, information that is not protected by the HIPAA privacy law in the US, I can really get close to the person. Let me show you how it works. So we infer the surname over here, and let's say that I know the age of the individual, because age is not, uh, not considered as a piece of information that is protected by HIPAA. And also let's say that we know the state of the individual, because again, state is not something that is protected by HIPAA. If we do this simulation, we take like, we simulate different ages, different states using the US census. We also took into account the covariance between state and age because in Florida people are older, just how to show that in a two dimensional slide. So we take the age, you take the state, and now we take some surname. You ask how many people would match such a profile of age, state, and surname. You do this process, let's say someone that is age of 40, lives in Colorado, surname Adams. You keep doing that for multiple rounds, takes a few seconds on the computer. You, found, you find that age, state, and a surname gives you, in most cases, 12 males 
or less. That's it. So we start, you know, we don't know anyone in the US. You have 325 million options. You get the age, state, and infer the surname. You reduce your search space into only 12 males in most cases. Now, when you have 12 males, you can simply call each one of them and see whether this individual participated in, in a genetic study. Maybe not me, but someone with a nice accent, a British accent, it's perfect. You call these individuals and you just by some social engineering, you can get to the person. Okay, so, so far I showed you that we can infer 12% of the uh, surnames and if I have state, age, and the surname, I can really get close to the person. But everything was with some hand-waving simulations. Let's see a real example how this thing works. So for, the, for this real example, we focus on the genome of Craig Venter. Craig Venter shared his entire genome publicly um, nearly a, a, a decade ago. We took his genome, we got, what happened? A second. We profiled the short term repeats on his Y chromosome using Lobster, an algorithm that we developed in the lab to profile short term repeats. And then every time we found uh, some marker, we just documented this marker in the Y search, um, searching uh, um, interface and repeated that for all the different markers that we found. These are the real results from Craig Venter. Then we hit the search button on Y search and after a few seconds, we found that Venter is a top match. So what I just showed you is that we can take whole genome sequencing data and infer the surname of a person. Okay, but now you might say, but Yaniv, come on, this is Venter. There are thousands of Venters out there. Can you get to our friend Craig Venter? And the answer is yes. Let's say we know that we infer that this is genome belongs to a Venter guy, lives in California, was born in 1946, and is a male. You can go to ussearch.com, put all these different identifiers, and click on the search interface. And if you do that, you find two records, one of which belongs to our friend, J. Craig Venter. And if you pay five bucks, you can even get a report about the uh, cell phone data, email, and, and so on, but we didn't have budget for that. We went cheap, and uh, yeah, keep it this way. So the point over here, it's quite amazing what you can do on, on the internet these days, right? <laughs> ussearch.com. Uh, um, okay, so now you might say, and if that's like, yeah, that's it's really great, but come on, you knew that this was Craig Venter when you started the process. Can you really breach the privacy of people that you don't know that are anonymous? And the answer is yes. So we focus on the Thousand Genomes Project, the CU population, the Utah genomes over there. We did the same process, use Lobster to profile short term repeats on the Y chromosome of the males. Then we uh, queried YSearch and smgf.org and we got certain predictions in eight out of the 10 cases we checked. The, the answer stores of these individuals using YSearch and SMGF were from Utah, which is a good indication that we are close in getting uh, to these individuals. So here is one example. We focus on this family. We infer the surname of the maternal grandfather and the paternal grandfather of this family. I don't give the exact details of this family just to respect their privacy. And after we, we got these two surnames, we went to Google and we did something similar to that. Again, not the exact same details. We, we Googled the identifiers and what we found was an obituary. And the obituary was exactly matched our expectations about this family. What do I mean by that? The surname of the maiden name of the mother was the same as the surname of the a maternal grandfather, the surname of the father was the same as the surname of the paternal grandfather, the number of kids uh, was the same, the birth order was the same, and this is like of, of males and females, and this is like tossing a coin multiple times and getting the tosses correctly. The ages of these individuals based on the thousand genomes and the, the obituary was exactly the same. So the chances that we go to the wrong family is less than five times 10 to the minus nine. We submitted the paper, we thought, wow, it's going to be great. And then the reviewers told us, this is beginner's luck. It's like one family, <laughs> come on. So we had to do it again with another family and yet with another family in the thousand genomes. In all cases, we, the, the probability that we found the wrong family was 
very, very small based on these demographic identifiers. In fact, we had so much data at that point that we could see the connection between the individuals in the 1,000 genomes and the individuals in the Y search and SMGF databases. These are not the same individuals. And this is important. This is what's so unique about genetic information. You don't need to have the same person in the two databases. Here, for example, this person was part of the 1,000 genomes. His second cousin, once removed, was part of this, participated in genetic genealogy, and because of that, we identified the 1,000 genomes family. In this case, how do you say this is complicated, right? So again, some far relative was doing genetic genealogy, and because of that, we identified the 1,000 genomes person over here. We, using like totally in all these families, we breached the privacy of 50 individuals by doing these internet searches and genealogical searches. Um, we published these results a few years ago in science, but before we published the results, we notified the NHGRI that we did a study. We didn't want to create any kind of like shockwave, but also we wanted them to communicate with the University of Utah whether they want to contact the families or not. And they told us we don't want to communicate these things to the families, but we want to write a response or kind of like a, um, our perspective about this identification. And I think this was a quite nice process of collaborating. And people were surprised by this process, but it's quite common in computer security. When you find a loophole, you don't rush to the press. You first notify the company responsible on the loophole, see whether they can fix it, you give them some time, and then you also uh, share your results with the general public. And we got quite a lot of publicity for that, and it was great because I think it's important to communicate this type of results to the general public to explain the complexities of genetic privacy. Okay, so, so far, this only was working on males, this strategy. Now let's see a strategy that works as, on females as well. Now, the starting point of this part of the story goes to relative matching using um, identity by descent uh, methods. Okay, so here we have these two third cousins over here. They are connected by these ancestors and they have some chance to co-inherit chunks of DNA. And these chunks of DNA are identical. These are identical stretches. If you look at our genome, they're basically base by base for this chromosome and these two regions are the same. And we call them IBD segments, identity by descent segments. Using this identity by descent segments, we scan our, basically in my heritage, we scan our database on a daily basis and we find this type of segments and this way we can connect between far relatives and notify them that we have some in the more individuals, more family members in the database if they want to reach each other. And this technique is quite powerful. If you look over here, this is the power to detect various types of cousins. And you have more than 80% chance to discover third cousins using this technique. So quite far relatives. Now, this basically process was responsible in the story I told you about Dotan, about my cousin, but also we have tens and maybe even hundreds of success stories at the MyHeritage database of connecting individuals from uh, Holocaust uh, survivors that found each other after they were separated as babies to some people like all over the world that just find each other, whether they're adoptees or other types of, of cases, connect with each other and find their family members. So it's quite powerful, this technique. Now the thing is that this type of find, finding relatives only work if your relatives were tested at the same database that you were tested. And in order to solve this problem, multiple uh, um, genetic genealogy services offer uploads, offer to bring your own genetic data and upload your data in their own database in order for you to augment your, your search and find more relatives. So we at MyHeritage, we do that and also uh, FTDNA, GEDmatch, and also my academic project at Columbia University, DNA Land, allows individuals to upload their data and find relatives using IB, IBD uh, segment uh, sharing. And just if, uh, I think most of the audience here knows that if you download your data, it's just a text file. So this is like how a text file from a genetic a genealogy looks like. All the companies have very similar format. Um, so you can just take this text file and upload the text file over here. Now, about a year ago, really in April last year, the police also realized, or the FBI realized, that they can do the same process. 
they can take DNA from a crime scene and develop this DNA, genotype this DNA in a similar assay to what genetic genealogy company do, render the data to look like our data set or the data set of 23andMe, and go to GEDmatch, which at that time was the only service that allowed unrestricted searches. We at MyHeritage, we don't allow the police, this is in our terms of service. They cannot upload, you cannot upload data without the consent of the person that originated the data. At GEDmatch, it's free for all, you can upload the data, and there are, at that time, no terms of service that prohibit that at all. So the, what they did, they, let's focus on this case, the Golden State Killer. The Golden State Killer was one of the most notorious criminals in the history of the US. The FBI has been searching for this person for over 40 years with no avail. They had his DNA from a crime scene, but they didn't find any match in a, any police database. Now in police databases, due to technical reasons that I will not uh, explain here, you can only find if the person is in the database or maybe first degree family member, in some rare cases, second degree family member. They tried all these different things and found nothing. So they consulted about, it was a year and a half ago probably, they consulted the genetic genealogy, Barbara Ray Venter, the ex-wife of Craig Venter, I'm closing the story over here in some weird connection. And she thought, okay, let's take the data and upload the data to GEDmatch. She uploaded the data to GEDmatch and she found a third cousin match. Then they, using a team of, of genealogists, they built an extensive family tree, look at the different branches of the tree, and eventually were able to find a profile that exactly matched what they knew about the Golden State Killer. Someone that lives in North California with some background of policing. They, they thought this guy actually has some background in, in police work. And then they, the age also matched. They drove, they collected the DNA sample. I think it was from the knob of his door, the knob of his car. Compared the DNA to the DNA from the crime scene, found a perfect match, and then arrested him and brought him to justice after all these years. And since then, this technique now became kind of like an avalanche of many other cases that were solved. And you see over here, one important thing that this case uh, in the summer was actually not even a, a cold case. This was an active investigation um, that they were able to get the DNA of this person, used GEDmatch, and, and already found this person. So this is not only reserved for cold cases, but we see now the police using the same technique for active investigations. So far, I believe we have about 50 cases that were solved using this technique. Up to um, October this year, I was actually documenting every case, and in October I was just, okay, this is too much. It's just like every week there are like a case or, or, or so. So it became quite popular. What we wanted to do is to know what is the success rate of this technique. Is this something that happens, you know, just some lottery tickets over here, this is like, or it can actually implicate each person in this room. So to do that, we look at the MyHeritage database and we conducted the following process. We looked at, at that time, like last summer, we had access to 1.28 million individuals. And then for each individual, we took this individual and we searched this individual against all the other individuals in the database. We excluded all the matches that are 700 centimorgans and or close, meaning all the first cousins matches and closer matches to avoid or, or to mitigate our certain biases. We know that people usually buy the MyHeritage kit for themselves and maybe for their close family members, such as their mom, their dad, their brother or sister. We wanted to avoid these ascertainment biases, so all the close matches we just removed and then we look at the matches that we, we did have and we ask what is the match on the top? What is the closest match that we can get? And if you do this process, this is the probability to have a match, at least one match, and this is the uh, total centimorgan sharing with your match, the, the threshold that you put. And just to kind of like annotate the centimorgan to different types of genealogical relationships, you can see over here, so between 600 to 200 or 220 centimorgan is one first cousin once removed, and then here you have third cousins, fourth cousins, and so on. What we found is that you have about 60% chance to have a match to a third cousin. So 60%, based on this analysis, 60% of the US individuals with European heritage will have at least a third cousin match similar to the Golden State Killer. Now we wanted to validate this result, so we repeated the same process with the GEDmatch database. 
Now, with GEDmatch, of course, we don't have access to the raw data, but GEDmatch has a very liberal policy in the way that they provide the data. You can access the account of each user. It's not even hacking. You can just go to the URL and just type the account, and you can get whatever user that you want. So we use the random number generator. We generated 30 different accounts, and I just checked them manually, and we conducted basically the same process, excluding closed matches, and looking what is the top uh, match for each account, and you get a very similar curve. So two different databases, there is some overlap, but not significant overlap between them. Two different methods to de detect IBD regions, and you get quite similar results. Okay, so we get to this, we have 60% chance to find a, a person in the US with European heritage, or, or to find a third cousin relative to, for a person uh, in the US with European heritage. But what, what will happen when these databases will get larger and larger? So to do that, we wanted to model, using population genetics tool, the chance of finding relatives as a function of the database size. In our model, we basically took uh, the following process. You have a population, and you ask, okay, in a population of a certain size, what's the probability that two individuals are related G generations ago? If they're related, what's the probability that they share IBD segments that we can detect using our methods? And then let's repeat this process with a database of a certain size that cover X percent of the population. So let's say a database uh, that samples 1% of the population, 2%, 3%, and so on. In this model, we, we have some caveats. That we, we assume that there is no consanguinity, and we have random uh, um, sampling of the population, basically. Now, despite these caveats, what you see over here, these are the results. This is the probability of a match to find at least uh, different types of, of matches as a function of the database size, coverage of the population, for first cousin, second cousin, third cousins, and fourth cousins. In 2018, when we conducted this study, we estimated that JetMatch covers about 0.75% of the US population with European heritage, and these are the probabilities for different types of cousinships. But just recently, the New York Times published that our friends at FTDNA decided to work with the FBI. And FTDNA has about one million records as well. So if now the FBI's access to JetMatch and also to FTDNA, then you go from 0.75, you get to something to like 2% of the US population. When you have 2% uh, coverage of the US population, the adult US population uh, of European heritage, then you have 60% chance to find second cousins, which is much easier now to go and to triangulate than form a third cousin, because the search space is much smaller. Okay, so we have now, we know that we can find close relatives, or relatively close relatives, to a, a large part of the US population with European heritage. Now the question is, but how can we do that in practice with demographic identifiers? So here is how this process works. If you have, you know, when you start the process and you want to find a Golden State Killer, you have 325 million options in the US population. You don't know who is the Golden State Killer. You assume everyone is a suspect until ruled differently. Now, if you have a third cousin match, your search space reduces to about 850 individuals. Because it's not only the third cousins, genetically, it can be also second cousin once removed, first cousin once removed, and all different types of relationships. So in total, each one of us have about 850 individuals around us with this genetic configuration of a third cousin. Okay, now, we wanted to know how demographic identifiers segregate on a population, so we, we used this study that we published uh, about a year ago in Science, where we built the largest family tree in the world with 13 million people that are all connected to one family tree. So using this data set, we look at the geography. We said, okay, let's say that you can narrow your search space to about 100 miles around the crime scene. Why 100 miles? Because there are studies using serial killers data that most of them operate within 25 miles from where they reside. A person doesn't wake up in the morning in Cambridge and then travels, I don't know, to like South England to kill someone. No, they, if they live here, they operate here. So you can really narrow the search space to 25 miles. We want to be more conservative. We said let's narrow down the search space to 100 miles around the crime scene. So if you do that, 
then you reduce your search space from 850 different uh, uh, cousins to 370 cousins. Now, if you can know the age of the person, you can estimate the age to about a decade accuracy. You know that this person should be in his 50s or 60s or 70s. This will reduce now your search space from 370 individuals to 33. And then eventually you can half your search space because you know that you're looking for a male and not a female. So then very quickly you get to about 16 individuals. Very, again, very close, very small search space. At that point you can start to employ regular investigative techniques in order to narrow down further the search space. So this process shows that with three simple piece of, pieces of information, you can get very close to the person of interest um, by that. Okay, so we also wanted to, to show that this process can affect, um, can identify uh, people that participated in research projects, such as a thousand genomes. So I showed you this CU family because we inferred the surname of this person over here, and we identified this family in the study that we conducted a few years ago. But now, just to show that it works on females, we took the female over here. It's a quite famous sample from the 1,000 genomes. We uploaded this sample to GEDmatch, and quite quickly, we found two matches, one in North Dakota, one in Wyoming. These two matches were kind of like distant relatives of this person, but also very distant relatives of each other. So the first thing that I did was to build a family tree for these two samples and to see who is the common ancestor of these two individuals. This can be done about 35 minutes of like online genealogy search, super simple. You get to this ancestral couple over here and now we know that this person is the descendant of this ancestral couple. This was a lot of work because you have many different branches you need to scan, but using demography data, a person that lives in Utah, we know about the, the, uh, the year of birth of this person, the size of this family, we can do that and then we're able to identify the same record that we found a few years ago from a different direction, an implicator. Now, the funny thing is that if you look at the common rule in the US, this is the rule that dictates how uh, we should protect human subjects. The new common rule that was, it was basically uh, it was, um, enacted about a year ago says that genetic information is de-identified. So everything is good, don't worry. Despite all the, um, everything that we know about the identifiability of genetic data, and I think that we should basically amend the common rule and take that and say that biospecimens cannot be de-identified. If you have DNA, it's very hard to de-identify your data. And we should not tell our participants lies, basically, about it. Okay, another thing that we can do is to have a very simple mitigation strategy. Basically, we can take a, a genomic data sets and what we suggest that companies will sign the genomic data sets with a cryptographic signature. Then when you upload your data to GEDmatch, they can verify that this data set was generated by a valid direct-to-consumer company and not by the crime lab of the FBI or other some suspicious labs, basically. So the process, <clears throat> it sounds very fancy, cryptographic signatures and, and so on. Basically, you take the file, this file, and you just add another line with a signature that is the product of your private key and all the information of this file, basically. It's seamless for the user. They can still use the data. They can look at the data. They can read the data. But it will signify to the third-party services that this data set was um, uh, developed or genotyped by a lab that is not some crime lab, by a lab that they can verify, that can authenticate its integrity. Okay, and then we published these results in, in science about a few months ago uh, with terrific collaborators uh, from MyHeritage and also from um, the Hebrew University. Okay, so I want to say something about genetic privacy. I want to conclude my talk. I studied genetic privacy for a long time, I think now seven, eight years, and I still don't understand the concept of privacy, I have to say. And I want to give you an example. How many of you heard about Ashley Madison? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you. So let's be mind, Ashley Madison was a website for cheaters. The slogan was, life is short, have an affair. Three years ago, the entire data set of Ashley Madison was leaked. It's out. Email addresses, sexual preferences, um, credit card numbers, even the passwords, because they use a really shitty hashing algorithm to protect their passwords. Everything was out. I downloaded the data. 
and I found 200,000 email addresses from Israel. Now, the country of Israel has 2 million households. So 10% of the households in Israel are affected by average. And I thought when this thing happened, I thought, wow, the skies are going to fall. This is not genetic information. This is the most sensitive data set that you can think of. 36 million people were exposed. And it's not only me, you know, some, uh, there was a, in the New York Times, there is op-ed in the New York Times about Ashley Madison recession because many people are going to get divorced now. So you're going to see a spike in small apartments. And I thought, I'm going to buy a small apartment. I'm going to invest in that. I understand this concept, right? Make some money. And the brutal truth is like three years later, nobody cares about Ashley Madison. Nobody remembers Ashley Madison. You know what? Ashley Madison today is still one of the most popular websites in the world. Number like 13,000 in the entire world, 5,000 in the US after this huge breach. As a negative control, I put a Sanger UK website. People care more about Ashley Madison than what happens in this room right now, okay? That's the brutal truth. So we really don't understand privacy. Something so bad happened, and as if the users don't care at all. You know what? Facebook, in 2012, published that they can affect elections. The randomized trials for political mob mobilization messages to 61 million Facebook users. In 2012, this was cool. Now, think about the study, think about the context of this study. Not cool anymore. Why is that? Because context matters, and this is why privacy is so hard, and so hard to get it right. It's not just about the technical data and how to protect data and how to make the identification. There is a human psychology over here that I think we still don't fully understand. It's very hard to process and to understand the implications of privacy breaches and how to communicate this type of uncertainties to people. So what's the way forward? In my humble opinion, is a system where people, where users can delete their account and walk away. Now it's a standard, it's GDPR, you, you can do that, but in the US, this is still GDPR doesn't apply. It's a system where you, get, you go from just talking about privacy, which is a zero sum game, data utility versus privacy, into discussion about trust. And because in many cases where people say, I want to retain my privacy, they do it because they don't trust you. But if you can develop these trust relationships with your users, you can empower them. Then it's a different discussion. People are willing to do some other things. You should not betray their trust, of course. And this is part of this dialogue. But then we don't need to go to this again. It's like battle of privacy versus data utility. So, and we published this basically, our perspective about that a few years ago in Plus Biology, and with this acknowledgement to this amazing group of people that I had the privilege to work with, the MyHeritage Research Team, and of course, the MyHeritage Research Participants, uh, I would like to thank you all, and I would get any questions. Thank you very much. You know, uh, listening to this, is there privacy at all possible, or it's not possible? Is privacy at all possible? I think, you know, we're all wearing clothes in this room, as far as I can see, and I think privacy is still possible, but, but when you say privacy, it's not total privacy. I think when we think about the concept of privacy, you have it's different facets in your life, and you behave differently with different groups of people, and you expose different parts of your personality about yourself to different groups of people. So again, it's context dependent. There is not absolute privacy because if you want to interact, you want to do something in this world, you always have to expose yourself a little bit. And we just need to give people the options to expose themselves in the way that they want and really understand the context in order to really to, to have a, a meaningful way to protect their privacy. So the genetic privacy is only a small part of the... Overall privacy, yeah. But I think so genetic privacy is... I said why well, there are several challenges. It's unique because it doesn't change. It's with you know from day minus day z, like before day zero, and also it affects your family members. And also historically, we know that it was something quite sensitive. One of the most like horrific crimes in the human history were based on a very flawed perspective about genetics. And I think this is part of the reason why we are so sensitive about that. I was wondering what about um, like ethnic biases in in those databases? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a funny thing, right? Because usually we worry about ethnic biases. 
we think about how police databases target minorities in much, uh, especially in the US, much higher rates, much easier to find certain uh, minor ethnicities in, in the US uh, police databases, probably other places in the world. Here, it's really the opposite because the people that usually go to these genetic genealogy services, including MyHeritage, are most, more affluent, usually are more, uh, we, we serve mostly the, the Western world and usually people with European heritage. It's much easier to target these individuals than people with other uh, with minority groups. <coughs> so it's the reverse kind of like bias that you see. So oh, the earlier question was a normative one. Is privacy possible? Mine is a technical one. Is anonymization possible? Um, and I say this because I've just recently conducted um, a study where many very well-informed data sharers and genomic researchers cite your specific 2013 Mm -hmm. paper about how anonymization is not possible, um, and ethics review chairs also cited as a reason why we should um, impose stringent uh, data protection and, and regulations around genomic data in order pr to protect it. So I don't know if that was an intended consequence, but I think when, when I have discussions with them, it's mostly, you know, we look to your paper to, to show the vulnerabilities in a system in order to improve them, but I fear what's happening is that by exposing vulnerabilities, people are exceptionalizing those cases and using it as a reason to, um, to, to take a very cautionary approach to data sharing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And it's something that we try to fight in our paper in a way, kind of like the last paragraphs are about exactly about that. We, we say in the paper, we don't want people to not to share their data for genetic studies. The point is that we have to be honest with people and tell them about the shortcoming of that, the caveats that we cannot fully protect their data. I think the likelihood, the, the thing is genomic data sets are, they, they cannot be fully anonymized if you want to share them on individual level. If you aggregate them and you just share a little frequencies, I think there is some technical debate in the field whether it's considered anonymizing enough or not using the Homer et al. study. I think it's, it's a good, it's very low chance that you can actually identify someone using this, this technique in, if you aggregate a lot of, of data. But if you share individual level data, it's probably you cannot say that it's anonymized. But the point is not about that, oh, let's not share data anymore because this is devastating. We need to help these families, right? It's not that we have some human on Mars that we can sequence. It depends on us. And maybe at some point in our life, you know, our loved one will be sick with some horrible disorders that we, we need access to this type of data sets. The point is just to consent people and tell them the truth and let them decide for themselves. Many people, especially in this room, they're aware of these limitations and still they share their data because they know that this is for the, for the greater good and there is some greater uh, uh, societal value over here. So I, I think this is a, like, I, I'm, it's almost like the opposite about what the, the intended consequence of our paper. We want to kind of like be honest and tell people like to share their data, although we have these limitations. So how do we communicate that risk? What is a realistic risk that you can outline in and consent to be fully informed? So I, I believe, and maybe this is another debate, I think consent should be very short and not very long because you cannot communicate too much. You say there is a risk that your data will be, we're going to share your data without explicit identifiers, such as your name, yada, yada. Studies have shown that your genetic data can still be identifiable. We're going to reduce this risk by putting a contract between, the, you know, one option, a contract between us and the people that we share their data that they are not allowed to re, uh, uh, to re identify you or to contact you and there'll be some severe legal consequences if they try to do that. However, we cannot eliminate this risk entirely. Very short, like, you know, paragraph, and, and that's it. People, the thing about consent is that it needs to be realistic. The, the, I, I think about the consent that I took when I did um, skydiving, okay? The consent was like, you can die, basically, and we cannot predict if you will die or not. Do you want to do that? Like, yeah, I still want to do that. I think it's, you know, pretty. And so we, if you could consent a person to jump from an airplane and die, why you cannot consent to share the data and with the risk that they can be re-identified? Can I just follow up on that question that uh, you know that in the context of GDPR now, uh, so the way that personal data is being defined is any data that is uh, with any reasonable measures can be identifiable. And this really opened a lot of discussions for people in the genomics because sometimes we are speaking about really sharing very minimum uh, variants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are seeing that we are moving in a direction that somebody, some people feel 
they take a very conservative approach. They feel that, okay, there, are, there have been all these uh, demonstration attacks that yep. genomic data was identifiable, and they feel that they have to just consider any type of genomic data as an identifiable data plus personal data. Yep. What, do, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's so, so first it's kind of like to separate, you know, some of these discussions, and I had, unfortunately, these discussions with people, they use this as an excuse not to share data because they want to have some competitive advantage. And this is like the first thing to make sure that this is not some, you know, they really care, it's about human subject protection, not their own career protection. And the second thing is that I think that if you share, you know, I think if you start to share genome-wide genetic data, then it's identifiable. If you share, you know, a few markers in a gene, it's very hard to, really identify the person, there are no some public databases. So we have to take some, you know, like a realistic approach, what is possible, what is not. But if you show genome-wide genetic data, now the question whether it's reasonable or not, I think only in the last like week there were two reports, uh, one in Bloomberg and one in BuzzFeed, that in the BuzzFeed report this was a, a journalist that uploaded the data of his co-workers Anonymous, like they didn't know who are the co-workers, but they are BuzzFeed co-workers, tried to identify them using GEDmatch. And he was able, a journalist was able to identify six out of the 10 without any like knowledge in genealogy and so on. The other one was a Bloomberg uh, reporter that was able, the genealogist was able to find her in three hours. I think this would consider reasonable, like, like it's a, like reasonable identifiable, this going like closer to the reasonable side. Again, we talk about the U.S. mostly. GDPR is a, U, is, is a European thing. We need to conduct these studies also with European populations and to know with which countries because it varies from country to country. Uh, in East Europe, I think we have much less coverage than you know in, in West Europe and, and so on. 